Good evening. We have a nice, intimate group here this evening. So I'm Rod Howe. I'm the executive director here at the History Center. Welcome uh, this evening, the trustees. Oh, oh she's, she's already planning to find that uh, card here. So the trustees and the employees of the History Center appreciate your coming to this event. Uh, how many married people do we have in the audience? Okay. Uh, are, do we have any first timers to the History Center here? Oh, first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I can see this yes. is going to be a nice, nice crowd. Right. All right. Uh, for those of you who uh, know how we operate, we uh, events are free, but there's always two donation boxes strategically located at each door. So there you go. Um, as the title suggests, Ithaca and Tompkins County have made a unique contribution to marriage equality. And it's been really interesting working with this group and a slightly expanded group. Some others came to some early meetings. And it was amazing to me that we were, even this group, was like, okay, which happened first and how do these relate to each other? So we, to me it was just another sign that it was time to capture this unique history and make sure it's archived. We, um, you know, I can imagine my granddaughters 20 years from now coming to the History Center and doing some research on, so what, what role did Ithaca and Tompkins County have in marriage equality? And hopefully there will be an archive here that they can research. So part of this whole process was for us to pull together the material, do look at the uh, papers out on the table there, but we're also inviting folks to submit uh, their perspectives, their thoughts, pictures of themselves getting married that we can add to the archive. And there are two forms on the back table that you can use to, because we have to make sure you're signing off and that you're agreeing that they can be part of the archive. So if you have any questions about that, let us know. There's a couple of folks that we want to go do oral interviews uh, with to capture their stories. If you're one of those, uh, let us know. Uh, thank you in, in advance to our moderator and our panelist. Uh, it's really been fun uh, meeting with this group for a few times. Uh, the History Center in, in the county, we're, we're a memory for the county. We're a place to archive our stories. And one of the things that we're very cognizant of is that we may not be capturing all the stories in the county. So we're, we're purposely reaching out to make sure that we uh, have a chance to collect and archive the many stories uh, from, of this county. And it's true that uh, our role in this issue is somewhat unique. Uh, and I think you'll hear some of that uh, reflected in, in the comments. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marriott Geldenheis, uh, who, by the way, did write one of the papers on the back. So take a look at that uh, to help further set the stage. So thanks, Marriott. Thank uh, you. By the way, we are videotaping this um, just so that we can share this with folks who weren't able to be here this evening. Thank you. So when the Obergefell decision came down from the Supreme Court, the summer, what I heard a lot was, Boy, this went really, really fast. <laughs> One minute, there was no marriage equality, and then all of a sudden, it seemed like in the space of one or two years, that a civil rights battle for LGBT people was won, done and dusted. And I usually just smiled and thought, am I going to spend the next half hour explaining how this really came about, or leave it for a different time? The, decision that in the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, that brought marriage equality to everybody in the United States really was the culmination of many, many decades of hard work by many people all over this country and, of course, internationally, which had a huge impact on us I'm going to interrupt well. you for just a minute. You should introduce yourself so that people know who's oh, giving this. Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Mariette Galvenheis. I'm an attorney in private practice. A large part of my practice for the last 27 years has been to represent LGBT people. Um, in the early days, I basically had to make up the protections I tried to cobble together for my clients. I have been reminded by my clients that I have said many times in the past 20 years or more ago that we will never see marriage rights for LGBT people. I am delighted to be wrong about that. And uh, so I participated in the local and, and national struggle for civil rights and will continue to do so. So to pick up the story here in Ithaca, Ithaca is known as a welcoming community. Um, it attracts many LGBT people. 
people like Jason and Jason who will tell their story. We locate here specifically because we're known as a welcoming community. That wasn't always the case. It's always been a mix of Ithaca being on the forefront and also in some ways being surprisingly hostile and unsafe for LGBT people. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to mention a few highlights and then others on the panel will explain their involvement in the struggle for LGBT civil rights here. The city of Ithaca was one of the first municipalities in 1984 to pass a law that prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. That was done quietly, there were enough votes on the council, so it was a deliberate decision not to make a big splash to get that legislation through. And then, LGBT groups locally, we decided, well, if the city can do it, so can the county. That ended up being a huge struggle. And the first time it came to a vote in July 1991, it was voted down, which was a huge disappointment to LGBT people. And it was also a very difficult time because the opponents were saying very harsh condemning discriminatory things, the kind of rhetoric that you hear now and the backlash was right here in Tompkins County. So we all rallied and it, on the second vote in December of 1991 it passed in a full high school cafeteria patrolled by the sheriff who were walking up and down the aisle between the pro and the con section. And um, other speakers on the panel who were on the legislature at that time and will regale me with further stories about that. So in the 90s, the, the efforts to advance LGBT civil rights continued, but you may recall it was a very hostile period in the country. DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, was passed in 1996 because there were glimmers of relationship recognition. So there were these preemptive acts to try and prevent LGBT people from getting relationship recognition. The state of New York lagged far behind Ithaca and Tompkins County. The Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act, which protects LGBT, LGBT people, not transgender people, from discrimination passed in 2002 after multiple attempts. And the same year, the city in 2002 passed the Domestic Partnership Ordinance, which was mainly symbolic, but at least was one way to get health insurance from the growing number of employers in the county who granted domestic partners health insurance. There was a, an attempt at <coughs> gaining marriage rights in the mid-90s in Ithaca. I happened to be city attorney at that time, and we put all our efforts into that case not going up to the courts on appeal on the merits, because we knew it would be a negative decision. I'm not going to expand upon that, but um, some of you who were then we're here, they may remember that. The atmosphere was so hostile that we were determined not to have the issue end up in the courts because we knew it would be a very negative outcome. And then 2004 rolls around. San Francisco, Gavin Newsom is issuing marriage licenses. New calls, Jason West is issuing marriage licenses. And Carolyn Peterson is the mayor of Ithaca and will tell her story about what unfolded here in Ithaca. And the Ithaca 50 refers to that time that includes Jason Lumberford, one of the new plaintiffs with his spouse, Jason Seymour. And at that time, 25 couples in Ithaca brought a lawsuit seeking marriage rights. The case was known as Seymour, Jason Seymour, versus Holcomb, Julie Holcomb, the uh, Ithaca City Clerk. And this unfolded in a very unique way, as Carolyn Peterson will explain. There were four of us, uh, Elizabeth Bixler, Rich Stumbar, Diane Grant, and I, who as pro bono attorneys represented the Ithaca 50. This over a two-year period went all the way up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals ruled against marriage rights. This was right after, a couple of years after, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled for marriage rights, and we were very hopeful that as goes Massachusetts, so goes New York. No didn't happen that way. And the Court of Appeals basically shoved responsibility over to the legislature, and we were quite despondent because in New York, sending things to the state legislature often means it's going down a dark, deep pit never to be seen again. 
And it took a good five years to get to the point where marriage equality was passed in the world in 2011. And then on the national stage, the Windsor decision came two years later in 2013 when a part of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, um, was struck down so that people who could marry in New York had their marriages recognized in the federal government. And that's when things really accelerated from that point on. Um, Justice Scalia in his dissenting opinion in the Windsor case said, this case is going to be a blueprint for people seeking full marriage rights. And he actually, in the decision, he has basically the argument outlined. And we all said, thank you so much. <laughs> and we took it and put it in pleadings. And then there was just a proliferation of marriage cases. But the whole process involved careful planning by national organizations working for marriage rights. And I'm very proud to say that in Ithaca, and the very important role that many people played in the marriage movement, we always very carefully consulted with national organizations and followed a very carefully planned approach. And in that way, we <coughs> took a very positive and very important part in gaining marriage equality and advancing LGBT civil rights in general. Um, yes, let me, let me just say that um, there's certainly going to be a question and answer period after everybody, but if something specific comes up triggered by remarks that one of the panelists made, um, please feel free to raise your hand and ask the question, and I will feel free as the moderator to keep that to a manageable minimum so everybody can get their set. Okay. I'm Barbara Mink. I was chair of the county board for five years and I was elected in 89. And at that time, the county was heavily Republican and the board was dominated. It was, I think, a, a nine to six majority, as I recall. And I had run on a platform of support for the arts and working families, but spent the first two years in garbage, essentially. It was the Dryden landfill dispute that took up most of the time. And in 91, the issue of protected class law, which it would turn out to be local law C, was first enjoined. And it was very difficult because the level, as Mariette alluded to, the level of animosity really topped the Dryden controversy, which I had never experienced before. And what seems to be a, a confluence of events is this is when talk radio really came to the fore, where newspapers and news media were consolidated. And I had been a journalist beforehand and was used to asking questions and to having discussions. And during the local law C controversy, I would have people, a lot of women, but a lot of men and women call me at home. This was when I had a landline. This was 25 years ago. <laughs> call at home, rant, and then hang up. So that wasn't a call to discuss. It was as if they were on a talk radio show and wanted to rant and then would just hang up. So it was a very, very bitter dispute. And on the county level, uh, the issue was votes, because it was so close. I was vice chair of the Human Services Committee, and that's what brought the measure forward. And I think I was active because I think Mary Call was not supporting it. Is that the case? So that's why I took a, a lead role, worked with fellow Democrats and so on. Let me tell you, Mary Call. She was chair of the Human Services Committee at the time, and a very nice woman and very progressive in many ways, but on this issue um, was not supportive. So we were focusing on one vote in particular, Charlie Evans from Dryden, my representative, also a very good person, uh, who was really struggling with the issue. And for most of the Democrats, he couldn't take credit for anything because it wasn't an issue. It was so obvious. But for people who really were wrestling with what they saw as a moral issue, it was a tough thing. And he was a, well, he called himself a legacy Republican because his parents and ancestors were always Republican, even though he voted with the Democrats most of the time. 
So up until that last, up until that evening of December 2nd, 1991, in the high school with the sheriffs and the dogs, uh, it was still touch and go. And I, re I do remember, now that you, when we had these meetings, it all came back to me, going out into the corridor and huddling with caucuses and trading votes, just the way politicians do. And Charlie agreed to vote for it, but what put it over the top was the chair of the county board, Jim Mason from Enfield, who pulled a John Roberts and out of the blue voted for it as well, and that made the majority. So he knew it was the right thing to do, and that, that was his legacy. And that was just granting protection for gays and lesbians as a protected class the way other protected classes. And if I'm not mistaken, you helped draft that three-line law. The law, I think, that was first defeated in July uh, felt like it was 42 pages long, single-spaced, and covered every possible eventuality of any kind of discrimination. And that was tossed out, it was not even voted down, but it was tossed out because this is why lawyers exist. For every line, there's a loophole. Mariette reduced it to three lines. Don't do it, just like you don't do other stuff. Uh, and that was the law that finally passed. So the city of Ithaca got down to much more fine-grained work when it came to marriage, when it came to granting uh, particular rights. The county was always the big picture, but overcoming that hurdle was real testimony to people who wrestled with their conscience, who didn't back down in the face of tremendous and miserable opposition. And uh, I'm proud to have been a part of it. So. And I'm ready. I'm Carolyn Peterson, the <laughs> former mayor of the city of Ithaca the first and only woman mayor, my claim to fame, which I will keep forever. <laughs> but you know, listening to the history, um, I'm pleased to say I was first elected to city council in 1983, so I was on city council in 1984 for the vote for the anti-discrimination law. And then I took a number of years off, but was re-elected again to council representing the college town ward, and I moved in 2001. So I was again there for the domestic partnership vote right, as well. So the, your dates just reminded me how long ago <laughs> I was first elected. Um, so I guess I'd like to create a, a picture. If you can imagine, it's 2004, and I've been mayor just a few weeks. And there's kind of the tsunami coming from California. <laughs> with uh, Mayor Gavin Newsom in San Francisco performing weddings in California, and then Jason West, as we heard in New Paltz, doing the same thing. And Ithaca is, um, I did not have to be reminded that this is a question Ithaca should deal with, but the emails and the phone calls uh, were coming in um, quite rapidly. So I needed to make a decision, and to do that, and because I had more of a collaborative approach uh, to governing, except interestingly, in this case, I didn't consult the Common Council. Um, I really consulted LGBT leadership in the community, um, the Land of Defense Fund, and uh, Empire Gay Pride Agenda, and other organizations, um, trying to find our way through this. Do I perform marriages, which did not have licenses and they couldn't get a license because the New York State Department of Health was not going to sign off on those licenses. Or do we find a unique approach in the city of Ithaca to um, support the, the rights of same-sex marriage and the people who love each other and are committed to each other to be able to marry and have the same rights as heterosexual couples in our country. And so, with much discussion and, and uh, a lot of meetings, which mayors love, you have to really love meetings <laughs> to be elected mayor. Um, we came to our unique decision um, with our city attorney, who at that time was Marty Luster, who had been a state assemblyman for I think 14 years. Um, so he had a lot of experience in the state and uh, was an excellent city attorney. 
um, what we uh, decided to do and was announced at a very large press conference uh, in March, my third month of being mayor, um, that the city uh, was going to accept these applications and bundle them together. The city clerk would take them and then send them to Albany to the Department of Health. What our expectation was at the time, which was correct, was that the health department would say, no, we cannot do these um, marriages, They're, that's not allowed. But what that allowed for us was to put us and the couples um, in a position to sue the city and to sue the state of New York, but kind of gave the couples standing to be able to do this and go into the courts in Albany. Our unique... It's not you said uh, with the marriage licenses, was it typical, like, let's say a heterosexual marriage prior to this, was it typical that they would, the, the license would get processed in the city and you sent it to the state for, uh, yes. for approval or final validation oh, or something? Um, no, not first. Okay. No, if I can uh, remember, the, a couple would come in and sign um, for the, the marriage license, but they had a very narrow window, I believe it was only 24 hours, in which they could get married. So I don't think that that had to go to the state at all. No. And um, so this was a kind of special package deal we're <laughs> putting together yeah. <laughs> and to send forward. Um, so, so once um, those were sent off and we expected to be sued, and we were sued, however, the city of Ithaca, the city attorney, and I took the position that we um, would take the side of the, the plaintiff and that, in fact, the City of Ithaca Legal Office and a number of Cornell University students um, would join together and help with the case. And um, that is what happened. Um, I had a, a note here, and since it's a small group, I could read it. Uh, Marty Luster and I communicated this week, and. Um, he, he wrote that, as I represented the city, as our city attorney, I was expected to seat myself at the defendant's table. Instead, I joined the plaintiff's attorneys as we shared the same legal arguments. And perhaps that's the type of story only a lawyer could enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was a very unique approach. As I was going through um, my files, I found a letter from constituent that was sent to the paper criticizing the city for spending tax dollars on this issue. But however, we were being sued. We would be spending money one way or the other, so I think they were just upset that um, we were taking a different position. But when, you, when you're sued, you're going to be spending money to put your case together. Um, so my heart was for performing marriages, but I knew that um, they would not stand in New York State, which I think is in opposition to California. The mayor couldn't sign off on the licenses. It had to go and eventually be signed off um, in Albany with the Department of Health. So um, I decided that I wouldn't do the civil disobedience of doing the marriages, and that was a controversial decision. Um, because there were numbers of people who wanted me to do the civil disobedience and do the weddings. And uh, people were calling out to me at the press conference um, to do the marriage, do the marriage. So that became um, you know, kind of the first uh, decision point. And I, I will jump ahead to 2011 and say that before I left office, after my eight years um, in office, I was able to perform same-sex marriages. And so you know, from the beginning of my eight years to the end, it really came full circle. Another controversy is many people felt that uh, county, cities, other municipalities should not deal with state or federal issues, just work on your local issues. This was a local issue that had such wide-ranging implications, and it was very important to be part of this change. That's how we met the Jasons. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Jason Hyderford, and my husband Jason Seymour here. And I um, had just recently moved to Ithaca in um, the fall of 2002, so we haven't been here too long. 
And in 2004, we read in the newspaper that, um, you know, we'd heard about all the marriages going on in San Francisco and stuff. And we read in the newspaper that uh, the new mayor was going to be making an announcement on, on what she would be doing in Ithaca about marriages. So we're like, yeah, got nothing to do. Let's, let's, go, let's go down to, to City Hall and, and see what she has to say. And we sat there and we listened. And I remember thinking, I had no idea what she was going to say, but I remember as she explained her position and, and what she and the city was prepared to do, I remember thinking, how did this? That's really an intelligent way to do this. Like she is obviously supporting us, but she's not going to break the law, and she's not going to essentially perform uh, marriages that don't hold any legal weight. It, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so after she sort of laid out her strategy, um, Jason and I looked at each other and we're like, okay, well let's let's go downstairs. Let's let's fill out the paperwork. Let's let's get our names up on there and. So we did, and um, then about a week or so later, there was um, uh, a town hall meeting organized by the Ithaca LGBT Task Force and a few other organizations. And um, we went there, and it was a huge, huge crowd. And some some folks from Empire State Pride Agenda, and um, um, I remember you were there, and I, I remember correctly, your a grandchild had just been born because you would like come in late or something. I, sorry, I don't know why that sticks out in my memory. He was born March 5th. That's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's like a curse. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> For me. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, it, it, during that meeting, they said um, if anyone was interested in, there was different strategies that, that were announced. There could be like, education, political, and, and legal. And um, we felt that we could do some of the, the legal stuff. So we signed our name, names up and um, we volunteered to put together quickly a website form so that people could um, submit their names online if they wanted to um, participate in. Um, at the time, we weren't really sure whether it was going to be a lawsuit or not. We just sort of exploring the, the options there. But um, it did turn out to be a, a lawsuit. And, um, uh, my husband Jason likes to likes to tell the story that when we handed over the, the names to the pro bono attorneys, including Mariette, um, that were going to represent us, uh, we did so in the order that the um, people had submitted their names online to, to the form. And our names were first because we built the form and we tested the form. Um, he said, had we known that, that they were going to use it in the exact same order. He probably would have alphabetized the names or something. <laughs> so that's how, that's how the, the case uh, became known as Seymour v. Holcomb. Um, but so I, I, like to, I like to tell people that we didn't really necessarily set out to be the lead leaders and to be this organizing force. Um, but it was a role that we naturally fell into. And um, shortly after, uh, we joined the Ithaca LGBT Task Force, um, and I became chair and co-chair very quickly and, and served as co-chair or chair for about six years. Um, but um, it was it was very um, it was very interesting. Like I, I, you know, lots of people say that you know, at least especially during the time, you know, uh, marriage equality activist. You know, I, I, I always have trouble with that term activist, and I don't know why, but I like to tell people that really I was just fighting for my right to be married. I want to be married. And if for fighting for my rights, it helps everyone else too, that's great. But I wasn't necessarily doing it for this big lofty cause. I was doing it because I wanted to be married um, and for all the legal protections that come with it. Can you speak about uh, the Canadian? marriages that had happened and like how they wanted to be part of our lawsuit and why they had yeah, to be so, so there were there were quite a few couples that had already been married in Canada um, which had legalized marriage uh, a few years prior and um, so they couldn't participate in our lawsuit because they were already married 
Um, and although at the time there was a little bit of question as to whether New York uh, would recognize those marriages, the Attorney General at the time, Anthony, uh, uh, sorry, Elliot Spencer, um, had said that New York should recognize those marriages, but it was, his opinion was not binding. It, was, it took a court case some years later to, to make it a binding thing where... Yeah, it was 2008 was the first court case. Yeah, so after the Ithaca 50 case had already gone through and lost, but um, it, for a while, from the period where uh, that case was decided, where New York would recognize marriages performed in other jurisdictions, but before 2011, when the Marriage Equality Act uh, became law in New York, New York was in this weird position where they openly accepted marriages performed elsewhere, but would not allow its own citizens to, to be married in New York. And it was, it was sort of weird, but um, that's the way it goes, I guess. Um, so, you know, I, I often, I'm glad you read the thing from, from Marty Lester because that, that's one of my fondest memories actually of, of the entire process is, is being in the courtroom that, that, that first time and, and feeling very proud that, that the uh, symbolically and, and, and realistically, like physically, there was the city on our side and um, it, was, it was a great feeling. Was and then that one lonely attorney on the other side <laughs> of the courtroom. Um, you know, and I gotta say, in 2006, when the decision came down from the Court of Appeals, the, the highest court in New York State, um, I was completely devastated. I was really dumbfounded, actually. I, I, I thought, for sure, how could they, how could they rule against us, and um, how could they say that it's not their job to. To determine whether our rights were being violated. That's, no, that's that's precisely why the courts are there. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I sort of really fell into a little bit of depression. Like I, you know, prior to that, we had been very available for media interviews. And after this decision came down, I, I just didn't. I didn't do any media for a while. And um, I let some of the other couples uh, do some of the media interviews. I just. I couldn't kind of talk about losing when I thought was going to win. Um, and then, you know, 2011 came and we finally won, but between 2006 and 2011, there was a lot of hard work done by a lot of people. We met with um, state lawmakers in Albany, in, in local districts. Um, we got people to, normal everyday people to, to for the first time, to be involved in government and to um, step forward and, and talk and take a position and, and talk to, to their, their lawmakers about why this issue was important to them. Um, so it definitely didn't just happen. Um, it took people to, to push for that change. Before I open it up, um, I want to, <coughs> in order to, to show how not only did it take a long time and not only um, was it not smooth sailing, but how the lesbian and gay community, the LGBT, very few T people involved in this issue at that time, um, was not 100% in favor of put, putting all of the eggs in one basket and going for marriage. I'm Nancy Barriano, I'm moderating. Um, so I was one of the people who was not in favor of dealing with marriage as a political issue. Um, and that's how I approach things. I didn't approach things as a lawyer. I didn't approach things as a potential plaintiff. I approached it as an activist who had been one of the seven people who got the city anti-discrimination ordinance through quietly. Three women and four men did that um, with the enormous help of Rachel Lother, who's a very decent human being and was on Common Council at the time and basically said, you, if we have the right language and if I count the votes, you don't have to have people marching down the hills in order to get this through and we thought a very good idea. Um, I, would, I had the, both the personal choice and the luxury of being out publicly. Most people did not have that 
at that particular point in time. I ran a lesbian and feminist publishing company. I was a professional lesbian, in a sense. I mean, that, that, was, that was my work, you know? And even if, even if the UPS man called me Mrs. Barriano when he delivered cartons of things to watch out for, um, I, right, I was out. So, okay, so I, it was very clear to me uh, that there were a lot of women, a lot of lesbians, especially lesbians of older ages who had been married in the heterosexual world. And the last thing that we wanted was to be married again. I mean, we had fled that, we had fled that world, even in marriages that were not impossible. Okay, my marriage was not impossible. But the thought of structurally being in that situation where I was somebody's wife, it was never gonna happen again. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, everyone has their own specific stories. But, but that was not an uncommon experience, and there was a certain rough age break in that. Um, younger women who were either thinking about having children and the uh, protections that marriage obviously gives if, if one has a child, and um, younger women for whom marriage was still a certain amount of white gorgeous gowns and stuff like that. Um, were much more inclined to support marriage as an issue than older women, you know, maybe 50 was the dividing line, 45 was the, something like that, um, who said, been there, done that, don't want to do it again. Yes? So I found it interesting when I read the Supreme Court decision uh -huh. uh, of like a lot of the history of marriage that led up into all the Supreme Court cases and like especially rolling back to like you know, women treated as property, right. and, and and all those types of things. Was that kind of like in your mindset? Oh, that with, kind with of like <laughs> that, that kind of logic. I mean, that even if it's two women, well, well, well. well no, who I was to have it, me own the other one, or you know. It wasn't about a rational decision. I had been out long enough. I mean, I was a feminist long before I was a lesbian. So the kind of like the structure of marriage was the thing that got me out of my marriage. But um, it, it, it left a bad taste. It's not that, personally, it's not that I thought that being with another woman was going to mean that the same sort of, not, not even roles, it wasn't about who took out the garbage, but the same kind of power struggles, the same kind of um, sort of fighting for everything that was your own and you had to fight harder because you were a woman so that you were on that kind of equal footing. Um, I, it's not that I thought that that would be true necessarily in the lesbian world, that I assumed it would be true. It was like, I just didn't want to go there. It was so easy to get married and so hard to get not married. I mean, it was a very, it took a long time to get, to get divorced, to have a, to have a, a legal divorce. Well, that's one of the talking points we used um, when we educated the community of like what civil marriage really means and what's the number of rights, responsibilities, privileges. It's in the thousands. Right. Yeah. So I always told people, I said, well, when you get married, you're super gluing all those rights and privileges of both of yourselves together. And when you get divorced, an attorney has to unravel those one by one by one. And that's why divorces are so complicated, take so long, and why attorneys love them. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know if Marion loves it. I mean, well, I with all love the work. <laughs> I have to say that Elizabeth and I were married uh, three weeks ago. That was after 20 years together, and we had planned on celebrating our 20th anniversary with a big party and the, our nearest and dearest. And then the Supremes came through. And it wasn't enough for us, when we had been talking about this, to have, I mean, we didn't care whether people thought we were married or knew we were married. I mean, what, who cared? As, as far as acceptance or societal normality or something like that. Um, but it was about the kinds of protections that married people have, that unmarried people, in spite of the efforts of lawyers like Mariette, just don't have. And, you know, I, um, I remember going for counseling to, to Mariette um, and um, talking about some of the financial implications and stuff like that. And she said, it's really important to be married when there's divorce or death. 
you know, and I was thinking, <laughs> you know, that those are the times it absolutely counts, okay, and obviously we don't assume we're going to have any of that, right, death eventually, but, I, but there were health reasons, I mean, that was the main impetus, that we were getting older, okay, right, so I, I just wanted to say that I never spoke out in, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I, I would not fight within my queer community and say, why are you taking this on as, you know, as the primary issue, and, and I knew, what's Wolfson's first name? Evan. Evan, and you know, I had met Evan Wolfson, I did public lesbian work, so I knew a lot of the people who were involved, and in fact, the woman who married us, she and her spouse were the original, among the 10 original litigants in the San Francisco case. Okay, my oldest and dearest friend. So when she convinced me that it was really a civil rights issue, when I could look at it as a civil rights issue, as opposed to people wanting to be married with all that that meant, okay, then I was able to open, no, I was able to open my head and think about it differently. So I, because I know the richness of the stories I heard around the table, I want to get back to what was unique about the city, Tompkins County, some of these interrelationships. I want to get back to that focus a little well, bit about- Well, why don't you ask, Sort of like, what do you mean by unique? Why don't you? Well, I, uh, in, I, I want to tease out some of the stories that I've been hearing around the table. So, Carolyn, you were called the devil mayor. What did that feel like, and what did you do about that? You know, I called my ass mayor's assistant yet, uh, this week, because um, Savanti Myrick, the current mayor, has the same assistant. And I said, did I leave my same-sex marriage file behind, because I can't find it at my home? And she found it, and it was empty. She said it had been purged, all the files had been purged. And so when I was looking through the old articles, I saw the references. I would speak and say, I got 40 emails, you know, five, five um, very strongly for marriage, and there were five. I won't even tell you what they said. And so and one of them was delivered to me at my office that said to the devil mayor of Ithaca, New York, and it came to me. <laughs> so, you know, and then there was another case um, where someone was harassing me and the police actually had to go to someone's home and tell them that they cannot um, threaten the mayor and think you can do that. And I was over this issue as well. So, um, and there was also, there were five um, mayors and officials across the United States, was Gavin Newsom and Jason West myself and two others, whom I don't remember who they were, but there was actually an, a national website you could go to where people could write to each of the five of us and uh, castigate us for um, these things we were doing or thinking about. So it's just, it's just a, a piece that, you know, we see the positive piece of me moving forward, but um, whether, whether you're Jason or anyone else at the table, when you take stands in a public way, um, even in Ithaca, New York, you have to say even in Ithaca, New York, there is that other piece and that undercurrent of, of actual threats um, to your, your person. And there's always the political threats. I don't know, vote for you. That I can handle. <laughs> the, the, other, the other threats against your, your person are um, things that, you know, I was only mayor for a few weeks at a time, and so those were big eye openers um, um, for me. How, um, how unfriendly and unkind people can, can be. Did, did you have those kinds of threats when you took unpopular when you took unpopular stands when you were on the city council? It, did the same people who called it, Barbara <laughs> ranted? Well, I had an assistant then, so when I, when I was on city council, I didn't. You know, then they call you at home. When you're a county board member, they call you at home. Um, but I had an assistant, and so she took the brunt of a number of, of the phone calls. But yes, there, there, were, um, there were other issues, too. And um, I mean, somebody anonymously threw the newspaper when you used to be able to write, um, what was that, a story chat or something that were anonymous. You didn't have to use your Facebook identity. And they threatened my grandchildren. So. That's what it can be like to be a public figure, even in Ithaca. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, yeah, so it has happened over other issues. 
they're just not things we, we talk about. Um, you know, and surprisingly, and, and when, when I heard of for the first time and a few others when we were in planning meetings um, for, for this event, and other people have talked about calls and letters that they've gotten in their home. I, Jason and I were so public during this time, and I can only remember one call we got, and it was from a supporter. And I don't ever remember anything negative until all, all that was sort of surprising to me, and like Maria had alluded to it in the very beginning, that you know, Ithaca is sort of known for being positive and being diverse, but there is this undercurrent there, um, and I guess sometimes you don't know about it. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why we moved to Ithaca was because of its reputation for, for being so gay friendly. And, and for me, what stood out was the, the first case that came in the mid-90s when I was you know, just out of high school. I remember reading this in this little town Ithaca. And I knew of Ithaca because I, I wanted to go to Ithaca College. But so when I read that, the, the city wanted to do um, marriages, but, but couldn't. And basically, that was their argument in court. I was like, wow, that, that's really awesome. And then for it to happen again in 2004 um, was, was equally as awesome. But um, you know, it was just that was one of the reasons why we moved here, was because of its reputation. And, and it's sort of disheartening to know that there's also that undercurrent. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm Judith Van Allen, but I'm wearing my hat as Ben Nichols' widow. Um, so do you want to you do you want to say we we used to be so the mayor from 1990-1995, and he was the mayor when the first marriage came came up when a couple came to him, um, a gay male couple, and said they wanted to get married. Now. Ben, as Carolyn will recognize about taking it as any criticism of her, was always willing to jump in and do whatever and didn't care what anybody said about him or to him or anything else. So he and Chuck Gutman, his city attorney, agreed that they would do it. They wanted to do it. But Julie Holcomb, the city clerk, wasn't willing to do it as they were willing to do the civil disobedience and violate the law of New York State and see what happened. But Ben wasn't willing to push Julie to violate the law against her own uh -huh. desire. So they ended up not doing it. But it did provoke some discussion. And um, I just uh, connected to that was the fact that Ben um, had the support of organized groups within the lesbian gay community who he hadn't really worked with before the 89 election. And he was so taken with that support. What he says, he went to them and you all, whatever, and said, OK, what do you want? And he said, a domestic partnership ordinance. And so he and Chuck moved as fast as they could on the domestic partnership ordinance. So they did you know, get that passed. And I, I checked the date, and I came up with a different date than you had made <laughs> January 91, a year after, which was before some of the county things. But I'll check it. Okay, right. The county that was at the end of 91. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it took that long to do the process of getting the law put together and, and then getting it passed. And my memory is that it was passed with one vote against it in Common Council. And that was Susan, whose name I can't remember. Susan Blumenthal? So no, 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 no. Susan the table. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll look it up. Um, and she voted against it because she thought it should only be for gay couples. And it included <laughs> heterosexual right. couples. Right. That's right. right. So, uh, so it was really unanimous for, um, anyway, so Ben had to give up his dream of, of uh, being the first mayor in New York to, to marry a gay couple. But he was so pleased when it did about later in Carol. But because it was under the radar a lot, this was it was all just discussions. It was in the newspaper a little bit. He didn't have to deal with what Carol had to deal with. Um, and he would have been much tougher skinned about dealing with it. But. And it was a totally different time then. In the mid-90s, when DOMA 
really started to, yeah, to DOMA was passed, and then all these other states started to pass their own versions of, of DOMA, and um, so the backlash was definitely there. And you know, Maria had spoken about the legal strategy of, of like you don't want a case to go to the Supreme Court if it's the wrong time because exactly. that sets precedent yeah, that's, that's going to take 20, 30, go 30 or more years to, to reverse. Right. Yeah, the, my memory is that the Lambda right, came and talked and, then, and they were not in support. Right. Yes. right. So Evan Wilson, it was a big yeah. dispute about, but you know, that was that, so. Evan Wolfson was at Lambda at the time and he ended yes. up starting uh, the Freedom to Marry, which was this amazing national organization he built. So um, in 1996, Alan Cohen became mayor and that's when I became city attorney. So this couple, the same couple who wanted to pursue the marriage license, then decided they wanted to sue. And so in conjunction with Landa and with the meetings in our office, we really tried to convince them, much as the city continued to support the right to marry, this was not the time. Because when you're trying to advance an issue in, within the legal system, you do not want a negative precedent. You want to try and time it right and choose the right plaintiffs and the right time. And you, know, you can get it wrong, but you, you don't want to push it hard at a time when you know you're absolutely going to lose. And um, Julie Holcomb, the, the clerk, the position she was in was she was sympathetic. However, the State Department of Health had directed clerks in a memo not to issue the licenses, plus, for her to have done so, she could have been charged with a misdemeanor. And we had a district attorney at the time who may well have charged her. Mm -hmm. So she was under tremendous pressure. So what happened then with the case in the mid-90s was the couple ended up suing. And so now we had this problem in our hands, what do we do now? We, we're supportive of them on the merits, but we really don't want this case to go. So the position the city took at that time, with help and input from Landa, is to say the court should dismiss the case not on the merits of whether there should be marriage rights, but because the state is a necessary party to the lawsuit, because they are the ones saying you can't do this. And without this legal, let's say, so if all the necessary people aren't in the lawsuit, they either need to be joined in or the case should be. So we went to the first level here in Ithaca, and much to our dismay, the judge did actually rule on the merits and said, there's no right to marry for same sex couples. And we said, okay, well, that's not great, but it's at the local level, it will just go away, and lo and behold, the couple appealed to the appellate division, which is the mid-level board. We were really worried at that point, so same thing, we made that same argument. So the good news is that the mid-level board agreed with that argument and they dismissed the case for failure to join the state. But the argument in the court was one of, I think one of the worst experiences of my legal career. Mm -hmm. So the issue was being argued in front of a panel of five justices. Oh, and that's typical, the appellate division, there are 12 of them, but about, like they have five sitting at any particular time. And the presiding justice was not only hostile, he was unbelievably disrespectful. And at one point he said, so what are they, want to get, what are they going to want to do next, marry an animal? And he was grinning and looking around at the other judges. And they all just sat there. Not, I thought one of the other justices would at least say, that's not appropriate or you know, this is anything. I don't care what. Not a word, and I put this in the article I wrote. I just stood there and I just dug my nails into the wooden council table so that I wouldn't say anything. I think those marks are probably still there in the, <laughs> the Troy Supreme Court courthouse. So, fast forward nine years when the Ithaca 50 case was being argued in front of the same court, not the same judge as many of them retired. I actually want to go back and look at you. Was still there, that would be interesting because they tend to be there for a while. But the tone was completely different. 
the justices were respectful, they were well informed, they asked relevant questions, they stuck to the legal issues, and we were actually quite hopeful after that mid-level argument because it seemed that the justices were so engaged. So for me, even though the Ithaca 50 case didn't result in a positive decision in the court of, in any of the three courts we went to, I could see a seismic shift between 2006 or 1996 and um, 2004 or 5 when we were in that court. So at least there was that progress, although there was still much more work to be done after that. How did you experience that? The middle of the court, I thought the same thing. I thought that the questions they asked, um, I felt that they challenged both sides pretty equally. I thought they were, you know, although I couldn't be completely objective, but if I tried to be objective, I thought they were they were asking very fair questions, and I thought they were being very fair to both sides. So I thought we had a pretty decent shot. Can I ask something? Especially the people I, I, I don't know necessarily. What did you come to hear? What would you like to hear about? Turn the tables. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small group, and it seems like everybody knows everybody. <laughs> so what have we not covered, or what, what kind of... Well, Barbara, while they're thinking about that, yeah. a question for you is, yeah. did you ever have any follow-up conversations with either Charlie Evans or Jim Mason? Did they experience any fallout from their constituencies? Did they, did you, did you have any follow-up conversations with them about those votes? That, yeah, that's a nice question. Uh, I don't remember having too many, except that Jim Mason was perfectly sanguine. Uh, and I think Charlie was okay. And probably because they were both such decent fellows. They weren't ideologues. And they had the respect and the trust of the people who voted for them. And they were good people to work with. So, no, I don't think, after all the Sturm und Drang, you know. Uh, but it's interesting hearing this talk about seismic shifts or at least progress over the years because some things haven't changed, even though a lot of things have. And I'm not even talking about just about marriage equality. Um, Mary Call, whom I mentioned before, was the first chair of the county, woman chair of the county board, and so I was the second. And there were tremendously vituperative calls to all members on various issues during the years. But when I was chair is when I started getting death threats. So that's when that happened. And I think especially when women are in positions of power, it's tremendously threatening. And the handwritten three-page threatening letter was, of course, anonymous and was, of course, traced to a woman in Newfield who couldn't believe how I was disrespecting some of the men on the board by being chair. So, uh, you know, and that was in the late 90s. And so a lot of things have changed, but here we are in election season again. Uh, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> I mean, gotta wonder. I, I, don't, I don't know if this is even relevant, but the thing about DOMA, like part of the thing about DOMA is that it was Clinton. I mean, it was. Yes. 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 Yeah, it's yeah, so, relevant. Um, <laughs> the people that you thought were yeah. right with yeah. you. <laughs> Well, I think it's not unusual for a minority, a disenfranchised minority group without much political clout to be thrown under the wheels of the bus right. when it's time to right. compromise. Right. You know, the most vulnerable people are going to be the ones who are sacrificed because they don't have the power to vote you out next time by themselves. I wish you would have worked with him. I mean, I, I, prominent gay organizer who had worked with them and was, you know, really excited about Clinton when that happened. Boy. Many of us remember that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I think that that's not only limited to uh, people with positions of power, obviously the president, but for example, within the lesbian and gay community, there was, um, 
I don't know how many years back, absolutely, virtually no support from the lesbian and gay community towards trans people, towards an inclusion of trans people as part of that unpronounceable four-letter thing, but, but in terms of the, the needs of trans community and how that, um, how that was related to lesbian and gay. Um, and so there were prominent organizations, as, uh, lesbian gay organizations, as well as individuals who just were throwing under the bus. Yes. And that's, that happened actually in terms of literally, I, I don't mean literally thrown under the bus, <laughs> but literally sacrificing trans needs yeah. to get certain kind of legislation through at the federal level. And you know. Right? Wasn't that's that's why we have yes. a non-discrimination law in the state that's not yes. inclusive. Yes. yes. Aspect. And trans was added to the protections in Tompkins County. I think that um, Pat Pryor was very involved yes. in, in getting in getting that through. And the city added it later by amending its definition of gender to include gender identity and expression. I actually, when I was preparing for this and reading all the materials, I think it's time to to lobby the city to change it to expressly say in its list of protected classes um, gender expression and identity because you have to dig down two layers to see that trans people are included and I think that's not right. Mm -hmm. It won't be a substantive change but I think it's a very important change and somebody is just looking at our discrimination mm -hmm. law. Yes. We've got things like height and weight in there. We can certainly be explicit about gender identity and expression. And those all things that the city values to protect why not be upfront about it? So, anybody want to join me in that project? Um, Let me know. Question from Mariette. I know we've heard some of our candidates for president talk about constitutional amendments of removing marriage. Mm -hmm. can, can you speak to the legal practicality of any of that? I mean, I know I've, a constitutional amendment is extremely hard to pull off. Um, is, it a, is there also a possibility that a new Supreme Court can undo one of their previous cases? Well, anything is possible, and then it is yeah, crazy. That yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> right. I think a constitutional amendment is highly, highly, highly unlikely. It is such a high bar. Mm -hmm. Many of us still remember the question is lower, the Equal Rights Amendment in 1978, right? Absolutely. It's incredibly Absolutely. hard to do, and I just don't think there will be enough that off. And the Supreme Court, yes, they have overruled themselves. If they never did, we never would have gotten marriage equality because they had to overrule Bowers v. Hardwick, the Texas case, and then Lawrence v. Texas did that, and it evolved. But I would be very, very surprised if, if the Supreme Court would go back on something like this where they extend fundamental rights. Is it impossible? Absolutely not. Is it likely? No, I don't think so. It's not likely at all. Will you, I love your line that you said about South Africa to the court. Can you tell people what you said to the to Oh, the, oh, when we argued the case. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, as many of you know, I'm from South Africa, and when I immigrated to this country in 1984, South Africa was not a model of civil rights, to put it very mildly. But when South Africa negotiated its new constitution in the early 1990s, it led to the first free elections in 1994. The Constitutional Drafting Committee included sexual orientation in the constitution of South Africa as a protected class. And my dear friend Edwin Cameron, who is now a judge on the Constitutional Court, was hugely instrumental in making that happen. That's, again, another example of one phenomenal person bringing about change. It was such an amazing time in South Africa where we all, those of us who were there or not there and, and you know, conversing about this, an opportunity to get it right. This was a once in a lifetime opportunity to really get it right. So it was included in the constitution. And I think it's still the only country's constitution that explicitly includes sexual orientation. So I have not been able to resist the temptation when arguing the case and other um, LGBT civil rights cases to say to judges that I never thought as an immigrant from South Africa that I would be holding up South Africa as a model of civil rights <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> they just couldn't make you practice. Yeah. I mean, South Africa, I don't know 
want to get into the digression. <laughs> <laughs> Every single case that's been brought on LGBT rights has been won. It's a slam dunk. It's in the Constitution. No, I guess violence on the Society, <laughs> violence against lesbian women, against women in general, yes, there are many problems, but at least the legal structure is there. And that's huge. Yeah, I, I'm just going back to, to Rod's question about what, what made us unique um, and I'm sure other panelists might have other uh, things to add, but for me, in my mind, one, uh, to my knowledge, we were the largest uh, marriage quality lawsuit with 50 plaintiffs. And two, we, our mayor and our city took a unique position. The city was supporting our efforts, even though they were being sued. Um, and, um, and, and our mayor did a unique thing by, by giving us a roadmap. If she basically said, "Here, sue me," and, and, and or sue us, and, and here I'm going to let you do this. We won't be the ones to say no. We'll let the state say no, but then you can sue us, and, and we'll support you, and, and we'll do this together. And and you know, so although on paper we were suing the city of Ithaca and the city clerk and uh, the state department of health. In, in reality, the city was, was with us the entire time, and, and that, to me, was, was a uniqueness that I don't know if any of the other cases shared that type of um, support. You know, I want to just follow up what you said about the, the largest case. Not only was the Ithaca 50 the largest case, and it just happened to, fortunately, 25 couples signed up within the time period, so 50 people, the Ithaca 50. You know, it was a completely democratic process. We had that large meeting, people came, we told them, okay, we've assembled a group of lawyers who will represent you pro bono, so fill in this form that Jason and Jason Design tested, put the name on there first, <laughs> and if you want to participate, just sign up, and I remember the lawyers sitting looking through the forms, just making sure that we didn't have any questions. But we did not vet the plaintiffs, we did not interview them. Every other case that the national organizations bring, they very carefully, they want the poster plaintiffs, right. the right. perfect plaintiffs, who are going to be so compelling, like Edie Windsor and her spouse, the talk about compelling, right? We didn't do that. We basically said, if you want to be part of this lawsuit, come and sign up. And I think that was really very, very different from any other role. Very different. Very different. <laughs> <Very, laughs> <very, laughs> yes. Yeah, because there was such, I mean, it's true. people were so enthused, and we as the attorneys, we had this conversation, we said, it's going to feel really awful to say, okay, we'll take two couples, or three couples, or five couples, and how, how do we select? So let's just throw open the gates, and we did have conversations about we just hope all of them at least stay together until the case is <laughs> done. <laughs> you know, because that's the risk you take. But that, that was really a very unusual situation. I think that the, the California marriage case, the city of San Francisco um, also supported their plaintiffs. Because I think that was a similar feature. But they, but they vetted. They vetted. Very they vetted very because yes. um, the, the couple who were friends of ours um, were both uh, public people in the sense of one had run the premier um, chiropractic practice in the Castro for the last X number of years, so all right. And the other one is a major literary person on the, on the scene, and one is African American and the other is white. And they were together for 18 years, 20, however many years at the time. So I'm sure they went through, the, the, the lawyers went through a similar kind of thing. It's like these were, you know, not, not for middle class, not informed America, but for within an LGBT context, perfect people. Yeah. That's the usual process. Well, for yeah. being an unvetted ragtag group. Yeah, you did okay. <laughs> And you talked about all those numbers of years, by 2011, when I could perform marriage ceremonies, it was with people who've been together, some as long as 30 years, and been married in my office or 
in, in the city hall chambers and it was so moving to be able to do those ceremonies and um, so moving for me and for the couples and um, crying, <laughs> lots of tears because um, people just couldn't believe that we were able to do that in New York State finally and um, and it was such a framing from 04 to 11, as I said previously, um, that I was just so happy to be able to be on both ends <laughs> and do those, those weddings. I could write a book on all the different kinds of weddings a mayor does, <laughs> from the belly dancing wedding to, uh, <laughs> but the weddings were great. And you know. being able to do them with that same sex couples, many of whom um, I knew were from town. And, uh, that, you know, as we're talking about some of these negative things, I just want to talk about this positive feeling um, that the time I left off. On that, on that same vein of sort of, you know, the circle, uh, when Jason and I in 2013 uh, decided to get married, we, we did come down to City Hall and Thankfully, Julie Holcomb is still the city clerk. And, uh, she didn't have to go to jail. She didn't have to go to jail. And you know, she knew who we were. And you're like, yeah, remember us? We, we sued you. And, you know, we, we could laugh about it. We got our picture taken with her with the marriage license. So it was sort of a good feeling that you know um, that we could do that full circle thing, where you know, technically, we were suing her some years back, even though. You know, she was, again, supportive of us, and then we were able to get our marriage license. Our names are in the case law databases <laughs> now for the end of time. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cynthia Philander, and this is my wife. Um, I just want to say thank you for sharing your stories. Um, before, I used to live here in 1999, and I moved away, and I met Allison, and I said, you have to, we have to move back to Ithaca. So it's just a really gay-friendly place. And, and so when we moved back, we actually ended up moving to Dryden. And um, a lot of our friends were like, why are you moving to Dryden? People are going to judge you. You know, you're, you're a gay couple. And so it was, a, it was kind of tough. But we got to know our community. And um, when the law passed, we were very excited. And we were just kind of nervous of who to invite. But we decided to open the doors and invite our community. And we were really surprised because most of our, mem our people that came by we're 60 and over, and it was just really wonderful to see that. But it's great to know the struggles and all the work that you know you, all, you folks have done, and so many people, and that we've been blessed to to have that. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that anyone wants to ask? Directly related, not directly related. <laughs> I mean, you're here, so it's a good time. I just want to emphasize that we know there's other elements that came into play, and if you have a story to tell, send it to us so it can be archived. If you have pictures you want to send, we know that Ithaca College, Cornell University, played a role in many of these strands, so um, it's a multifaceted story, so we want to get as much of those strands as possible. And here's just one little um, sort of PPS, which is, I always feel the need to clarify this because many people don't understand, which is when you have domestic partner benefits, which by the way have been taken away in many places from heteros non-married heterosexual couples because they, they are able to marry, okay? So there are institutions who've taken away domestic partner and benefits for yeah. and for gay couples, okay, sort of in one fell swoop. But when you have domestic partner benefits, it means that you're eligible to be included for health insurance, let's say. It doesn't mean that the institution pays for, for, the, for the coverage. And I, I've spent a lot of time explaining that to people. It sort of opens the door and gets you in the right office, but it does not cover the expenses of that. In fact, the, the, the partner who is part of the institution um, gets taxed on that on that money that's put towards the health insurance or whatever the other benefit is. The city paid. The city paid from the beginning. Really? Yeah. See, so Ithaca College definitely you did not. Actually, Ben and I became domestic partners <laughs> in solidarity <laughs> for a while before we got married. 
that I got a needed health insurance. Needed health insurance. So the city, yeah, yeah, the city paid, but they could do, couldn't do anything about the tax issue. So the employees still had the value yeah. to several thousand included yeah. in their tax so I think we're a small enough group that we can, Marietta I think has a couple of closing comments. We can let people leave who need to leave, but if people want to continue the discussion informally, that would be fine. So Marietta, I think you just wanted to yeah. say a couple of closing we remarks. We thought about maybe wrapping up, even though it may seem like wrapping up on a somewhat of a down note, what is left to be done? My biggest fear is that the public in general will say, Okay, you got marriage, now go away, be quiet, you know, go live in your houses and just don't bother us anymore because we've given you what you wanted. But there's so much that's left to be done, starting with implementing this marriage decision, as we have seen, is quite a challenge. And having to go to court and in some cases people needing to sit in a quiet place to think about it so that they can go to their jobs and implement the decision. There are many battles across the country around that, and that situation also ties right into the abuse of the religious exemption now. Many states are pushing laws now that twist the religious exemption into using religion as an excuse to discriminate. And if you place any other protected class um, in the sentence other than LGBT people, it becomes obvious how absurd it is. And there have actually been wonderful cartoons given the situation that's been going on about how absurd these exemptions are, but they're a real threat, and these laws are being fought back in many, many states. We'll have to see how that unfolds. We've already talked about transgender persons not being included in so many of the laws that do exist. The gender, the State Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, look at how many years is that? Since 2002 when the yeah. decision was made to exclude Every it Every year, it's, it's introduced and goes absolutely nowhere. And that is a crying shame in New York, that we still don't have this this many years later. And then more broadly speaking, we have marriage for same-sex couples, but no other civil rights protections. So there are many instances of people in Arkansas, for example, and other places, they get married, they come back to work, there's a picture on their desk of them and their spouse, and they get fired. Of course they can be because they're not, there's no protection from discrimination broad-based for employment, for housing, for public accommodations. So really the next wave is to include LGBT people in the Civil Rights Act. If you look around Congress, that seems unlikely, so I expect things are going to go up, back up to the Supreme Court issue by issue by issue. Mm -hmm. I mean the sweeping change that came about with the Civil Rights Act is really needed on this issue. It could take a while. So that's going to be really important. And then one other piece that affects us right here in New York and in many other places, if I look at the information I'm getting from LGBT colleagues who are in the state, parenting. There are still huge problems with parenting rights for same-sex couples. We thought, we hoped, that once same-sex couples could marry, that both of them would be recognized as legal parents in all situations. The courts in New York are not doing that. Even though both parents, let's say a lesbian couple have children, one of them is the biological mother and one is the non-biological mother. Even if they were married when the child was born and they can now both go on the birth certificate. The birth certificate doesn't, shoot, uh, doesn't prove that they're the parent. Courts are ruling that the presumption that a child born during a marriage is the, parent, the child of both parents cannot apply to same-sex couples because it's biologically impossible. So same-sex couples who are married still have to adopt their children. And that's still the gold standard. And it's really hard to explain that to people. I find it very offensive that people have to do it. And I absolutely insist that they do it so they don't run into this problem. I was just consulted this morning by an attorney in Elmira who has a horrible case going on. Married same-sex couple, two women, both on the birth certificate. They used to know the owner. He is suing for custody. Um, and it looks like he's going to win. Right here, 20 miles down the road. In Ohio. Huge issue. And just last week, last Friday, so up it's not even that they're 
not even the they couple. They are splitting itself. up. The couple is intact. He's attacking uh, the parentage of the bottom line. And, and just last, we've always said adoption is the gold standard. Adoption, adoption, adoption. No court, even in the darkest 90s, had refused to recognize an adoption. And if, if a court of one state grants an adoption, then under legal, well accepted legal theories, then another state's court can go and say, oh, but we don't think the adoption was done right, or did that court have jurisdiction? No, mm -hmm. they're stopped from doing that. They have to under something called full faith and credit. Another court issued a judgment, another state has to accept it. Otherwise, there would be complete chaos, right? The Alabama Supreme Court last Friday ruled that it was not, it's a couple splitting up, one attacked the adoption, the court disregarded the adoption that was done in Georgia, saying that it didn't think under Georgia law, an Alabama court is saying under Georgia law, they don't think the Georgia court should have granted the adoption under the state of their law. So now we're in the position of advising people who did their adoptions before they could be married in states that didn't have either a court case or a statute saying they could adopt it, they now have to re-adopt their children just so that this kind of thing could, couldn't happen to them. Mm. So we have plenty of work left to be done. Um, and I think it's just important to be mindful of that. Much as we're celebrating, and yes, we certainly deserve the joy of the celebration for the civil rights advance, we need to really stay engaged and keep at this, and I think it's gonna be a couple more decades at least before we can really feel that the, the protections are coming. And I'd like to invite everybody who's present, and you certainly can encourage other people who are not here tonight to stop by, um, to um, fill out the cards that are there, to think about submitting material, if you have material that you think should be in the archives of the History Center. Um, certainly Rod and staff are more than happy to set up time to talk to you about what's appropriate, what's not, what form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, um, it's really important to do that because we're all here. And eventually we won't be, so. Um, <laughs> This is, this is one of the places where um, the, the significance and record of things that happened in your lifetime that directly affected you and people you know that you would talk to can be preserved. Well said, well said. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you all.